Colonel Mustard, so nice to have you staying with us. Yes, dirty, rotten line. I beg your pardon. Oh, no, 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 no not you, Colonel. It's this new edition of the Muffy Hines Guidebook. She gave us a terrible rating. Five dirty towels. Says it's her lowest rating ever given. No, oh, surely there are worse places than this, nobody. Oh, thank you for that vote of confidence, Colonel. <laughs> and how is that old war injury? Still seeing little white rabbits with tommy guns? Oh, no rabbits, nobody. Mm -hmm. Caribou, though. <laughs> This is part of my new promotional idea, the Nobody's End International Food and Dance Festival. This will put that Muffy Hines in a lousy guidebook in its place, and us on the map. <laughs> well, I'll have a little sit-down over here. Yes, yes, you do that, Colonel. Rest your brain. Forty days and forty nights of food, fun, and fancy footwork. <laughs> I am an extremely clever nobody. Monsieur Nobody! Who employs an extremely annoying temperamental chef. Ladies and gentlemen, c'est moi, Antoine de Bonbon, the world's greatest chef, the man who makes the cooking of Julia Child look like the day-old doggy bag. Wouldn't care to rein it in a bit there, eh, Antoine? Oh, Monsieur Nobody, uh, did you eat the mushrooms last night, eh? Yes. And you feel all right today? Yes. Zut, I lose the bet with the waiter. Quel dommage. So what's on what little's left of your mind, Antoine? Oh, merci, Monsieur Nomadi. I almost forgot. Mm. I quit! Oh, you say it, but you don't do it. No, no, this time I mean it. Mm. Oh, could you hold on a second, Antoine? Amazing. Now, why are you quitting this time, Antoine? It is this ad in the newspaper. The Nobody Seen International Food and Dance Festival. Yes? You say in this ad that Chef Antoine de Bonbon will create a choice of 100 different five-course meals. Impossible! Well, maybe I did exaggerate just a teensy-weensy bit. Ah, oh, Monsieur Nobody, you drive me crazy. It's a short trip. You destroy my reputation. 100 different five-course meals? Not even a chef as extraordinary as moi can do such a thing! Nobody, Antoine, what in the world are you two fighting about now? Nothing, my pet, nothing, nothing. Madame Nobody, you are a reasonable person. Do you know what your miserable husband has done now? Oh, dear, what now? He puts an ad in the newspaper saying that I will create 100 different five-course meals. He's insane! Cyril, did you? No! Cyril? Yes. <sighs> Voila, you see, Madame Nobody? I quit! You'll have to excuse me. I have to go pack my stove! Zoot! Oh. Oh, dear, how could you? Well, I was just trying to drum up a little business for the end, Jane. <sighs> well, you'll have to cancel the ad. No. It's like that time you offered Chinese food all you can eat. What was wrong with that? Cyril, you only offered the customers one chopstick. Oh, uh, could, could, could you hold on? Just, just one, one second, Jane, one second. Ha-ha! 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 Yes. Rats. No one's going to get you out of it this time, Cyril. Well, you, just, you just can't get good help anymore. Come and look at our dining room menu. All right. See, there's no way in the world Antoine can offer 100 different five-course meals. Well, what do you mean, dear? Well, look. We only have three appetizers, two soups, two salads, four entrees, and three desserts. Three plus two plus two plus four plus three equals 14. There are only 14 different dishes on a menu, dear, not 100. 
Well, I've got it. We'll add to the menu. Oh, Cyril, we can't afford to do that. No, no, no. We'll just pretend to add to the menu then. But we'll list dishes that no one in their right mind would ever order, like baby elephant omelets, or monkey pate, or poison ivy salad, or salamander soup. And... Cyril, that's disgusting. And I won't allow you to lie. All right. What is that? Hey, <laughs> Eureka! Eureka, it means I am a genius. Oh, we know, Antoine, we know. <laughs> Madame Nobody, believe it or not, Monsieur Nobody was telling the truth. I can make more than 100 different five-course meals. I love you. What? How could that be? I, I mean, uh, yes, yes, of course, of course. I don't understand, Antoine. As far as I can see, there are only 14 different dishes. No, Madame Nobody, look more closely. It is a question of combinatorics. Combinatorics, you see? I knew that. What are combinatorics? Ah, look at the menu. Three appetizers, pate, arts of celery, melon. Two soups, tomato and onion. Now... Consider the combinations possible, eh? Pate and tomato soup. Arts of celery and tomato soup. Melon and tomato soup. Or onion and melon, onion and hearts of celery, onion soup and pate. We oui. Three appetizers, two soups. Three times two is six. It's a total of six. Well, that's a far cry from 100. Ah, but you have to keep on going, Monsieur Nobody. Three appetizers, two soups, two salads, four entrees, three desserts. That's three times two times two times four times three. Three times two is six, times two is twelve, times four is forty-eight, times three is one hundred forty-four. Oh, my gosh. One hundred forty-four different five-course meal combinations. <gasps> Antoine, you've done it. I think you've done it. Oh, you see, I told the truth in spite of myself. Monsieur, I am French after all. Yes, yes, Antoine. I forgive your people for giving that award to Jerry Lewis. I adore Jerry Lewis. Not so fast, nobody. Yes? I was just reading the rest of this ad. Yes? You also promised that everyone coming to Nobody's Inn will be given a 12-piece living room set, free checking, and lifetime season tickets for the Dallas Cowboys. Yes, well, it's, uh... Timing is everything, love! Play, gypsies, play!
Peaks, the show that looks for nifty math in the newest movies. I'm Ross Sherbert. And I'm Gene Sispu and Ba. On this week's edition of Sneaky Peaks, we'll be taking a look at the latest addition to the continuing saga of Pollyanna Jones. Yes, if you love Marauders of the Double Parked or Pollyanna Jones and the Quest for Wholesale, you will get a large charge out of Pollyanna Jones and the Pyramid of Perplexity. Let's take a sneaky peek. First, it was the snake. I hate snakes. I hate them. And then, Polly, we had to go through that accursed bug tunnel and me without any change for the door. Oh, bugs, I hate them worse than snakes. Then rats. Oh, the rats. Oh, rats, the worst. I hate them. Tell me, Polly, why do you put up with all this? I love nature. <laughs> Just so. Well, at least we're safe now. There's nothing that can harm us here in the desert. Dr. Polly, oh! I presume. <laughs> Noted archaeologist, mathematician, and loather of creepy crawlies. You presume correctly. And this is Holly Gully, my good friend and best digger in the Middle East. It doesn't list our fax number. Who are you? Malamar Tut, ruler of all I survey and all around nice guy. Dr. Jones, thank goodness you are here. We need your help desperately. What seems to be the trouble? It's the pyramid of perplexity. <laughs> One of the famous half pyramids? The very same. You know, I always wondered why I only build half pyramids. The zoning regulations are crazy around here. Oh, I see. Well, how can we help? We need to know the height of our pyramid so that we may enter the my pyramid taller than your pyramid contest. But there's this problem. What problem? The pyramid is haunted by the mummy of the ancient pharaoh, King Ramalama Ding Dong the third. He will allow no one to climb to the top to measure its height. You know, I think I can help solve this problem. Holly, lend me your walking stick. <laughs> What's the matter? I thought it was a snake. I hate snakes. We know, we know. Sorry, guys. Okay, Holly, put the stick in the sand. How in the name of Omar Sharif is this going to help us? Frankly, I agree. I mean, what's the point? I mean, excuse me for living, but the lack of math in this movie so far gets from this critic a big thumbs down. This film wasn't released. It escaped. Hang on, Gene. I think Pollyanna's onto something pretty clever. Well, we'll see, smarty pants. Roll the next clip. I learned this while studying the ancient manuscripts of the great Greek philosopher Thales of Miletus. I must have been playing outside with the other kids. All right, Holly. Go and measure the length of the shadow that is cast by the pyramid. Oh, a thousand pardons, Polly, but I don't understand. Look, here is the pyramid. It casts a shadow. Go and measure the length of the shadow from the pyramid's base to the end of the shadow. Got it, Polly. Now what, Dr. Jones? This is the stick. Hmm. Measure the length of the shadow that is cast by the stick. Gladly. Oh, measuring a shadow. What a concept. <laughs> Dr. Jones, if the length of the shadow is not four feet, may I bite my own tongue? No need to be melodramatic, Malamar, I believe you. Holly, what's the scoop? By all that is blessed, Polly, the length of the pyramid shadow is 600 feet. Okay, so the pyramid is taller than the stick. So its shadow is longer. How much longer, Polly? 600 divided by 4 is 150. 150 times longer. That means that the big triangle is 150 times bigger than the small one. That's right, Holly. So that means that the pyramid is 150 times higher than the stick. Malamar, how tall's the stick? Dr. Jones. If the stick is not three feet high, may camels trample me to the thinness of a tuna melt on pita bread. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Let's see. The pyramid is 150 times higher than the stick. 150 times three is 450. The pyramid of perplexity is 450 feet high. 450 feet high, praise be. Oh, excuse me for being a doubting Holly Gully, Polly, but how can you be sure? Oh, Holly, I can even measure your height using the same method. Oh, golly gosh, will wonders never cease? Stand up straight, this won't hurt a bit. Take off your hat. Malamar, if you please. Gladly. Ooh. <laughs> 
Eight feet. Eight feet. That's two times the length of the stick's shadow. The stick is three feet tall. You must be twice that. Six feet tall. Six feet. Exactly right. But I'm afraid of heights. Dr. Jones, please accept our hospitality and stay for the evening. Oh, yes. Polly, Polly, let's stay. Everything seems so safe here. There's nothing that could possibly happen to us. I uh, guess you're right, Holly. What could go wrong? <laughs> I hate money. Yeah. Okay, okay, I admit it. You and Pollyanna Jones were right. That was pretty darn clever. Yeah, sure, Gene. Similar triangles in proportion, geometry in action. Now, speaking of math, what score do you give Pollyanna Jones in the pyramid of perplexity? On a scale of one to ten? I give it an eight. And I give it a nine for an average score of eight and one half. Eh, not bad. <laughs> Be sure to join us next week when we'll take a sneaky peek at the latest film by Enfant Terrible, Jean-Luc Malcontent, the French film director who's ten years old. It's called My Detention with Andre. See you then. Let me get this straight. You think Zeppo is a funny one? Yeah, in an existential sense. Oh. The story you are about to see is a fib, but it's short. The names are made up, but the problems are real. It was Tuesday, 4.43 p.m., and New Yorkers were complaining about bad economic times. How bad was it? It was so bad, pickpockets in Midtown were putting wallets back. The boss is Joe Greco. My partner is George Frankly. My name is Tuesday. I'm a mathematician. Charlie McShtick was a ventriloquist dummy who could talk. Edgar Bergman was a ventriloquist who couldn't. We called this one the case of the smart dummy and decided to look at scenes of earlier shows to get up to speed. And you... After George introduced me to Charlie and said he needed help, Charlie said... That's why we're here. Where are you usually? Usually? Well, I was born in Northern California. Where? Sequoia National Park. When? Ash Wednesday. Ever pine for it? Occasionally I bustle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's enough, you two. What the heck is going on here? I almost wish I hadn't asked, because they told me. Charlie and Edgar, and a third member of their act, a dummy named Lolly, were returning to New York after several days on the road. When they got home, Lolly and the bag she travels in were missing. Edgar went into shock and hadn't spoken since. He had picked up another bag, which looked like the one containing Lolly, but it yes, turned it out to contain. To but there's over a million bucks here. Want to go to lunch? You think Edgar was shocked? Wait till the other guy opens his case. What do you mean? If you had a suitcase with a million bucks in it and got home and found out it had been switched for a dummy named Lollipop. I see what you mean. Bags at airlines get switched by mistake all the time. So I called TWM to get the name of the other traveler. What's the name, Pat? Strange. What? No one has called. Charlie, when did you get in? Last night. Maybe he hasn't missed his bag yet. Maybe. But if you had a million dollars in your suitcase, wouldn't you open it to check? We examined the claim checks on the bag and figured out its possible routes. But that didn't help us locate the owner, and it didn't explain why he hadn't called the airlines to get his suitcase back. You know, Pat, maybe the guy who owns the suitcase hasn't called because he can't. You mean he can't get to a phone? Well, what if the money is illegal? Suddenly, we thought Charlie and Edgar might be in danger, and George phoned Charlie to warn him to lock the apartment and stay inside until we arrived. have been won with less firepower. Charlie, you're going to have to stay on guard. The person who has Lolly may be a crook. And he may be looking for you to get his money back. But I haven't got his money. Besides, how's he going to find me? Well, he's, he's got Lolly, so he's got to know he's looking for a ventriloquist. 
Good point, George. He'll trace her. How would he do that? I'd begin at the beginning. Trees? After that. Ventriloquist dummy makers. We should ask Benny to check on it. May I? Oh, be my guest. Oh, you know where else a guy might check? Where? Where? With show business agents, the people who get jobs for us. Do you have an agent? One of the best. What's his name? Her name is Broadway Annie Rose. <laughs> Broadway, Annie Rose, what do you do? Ma'am? What is your show business speciality? Juggling, singing, eating, math? Math net. We don't get much call for math net. You ever do math without a net? You misunderstand. We're with math net and we'd like to see Broadway, Annie Rose. Are you Broadway, Annie? The sun will come out. Thanks for seeing us, Broadway Annie. Likewise, I'm sure. Now, what can I do for you? We'd like to ask you about one of your clients. Mm -hmm. Three of them, actually. Charlie, Edgar, and Molly. Great act. Want to book them? No. Anything wrong? Yes. Lolly's been dummy napped. <gasps> That's terrible. Any suspects? Not really. Woodpeckers is where I'd put my dough. If not woodpeckers, termites. We don't think so, Broadway Annie. But we want to know if anyone's asked about them. No. They just finished a tour I booked for them. You're their agent, right? Right. I'm their 10 percenter. 10 percenter? That's right. Talent agents are called 10 percenters because we get 10 percent of the money our clients receive. That doesn't seem fair. Do my ears detect sass? Well, no, but... Hey, agents are entitled to at least that much for putting up with these artists. Besides, I get them the gigs, and scheduling ain't easy. You mean you find jobs for your clients? Right. Not only get them jobs, I have to schedule their travel. Now, here is their last tour. I sent them from New York to Detroit. They performed in Detroit? No, in a town called Ann Arbor, Michigan. But see, that's my problem. You can't fly into a lot of these little burbs. Next, they played in Middletown, Ohio. No flights, right? You got it. So, I route them to Dayton. They rent a car and drive to Middletown. Then they flew on to Des Moines, Minneapolis, Columbus, and New York. In fact, they just got back a couple of days ago. Just out of curiosity, how much money did they make for this tour? 75,000. So you got 10% of 75,000? That's right. 7,500. You have a nice business. Hey, it's not always big bucks, lady, let me tell you. Did you see the foot juggler out front? Uh-huh. You didn't shake with him, did you? No, why? The last guy who did got athlete's hand. Anyway, he hasn't had a job since I booked him for a podiatrist luncheon in Soho. Paid $47.50. $4,750? $47.50. I made $4.75. Hardly covers the Desinex. <laughs> I take it back, Annie. You really do earn your 10%. You can bet your sweet smile on it, toots. <laughs> Annie... If anyone inquires about Charlie and Edgar, I'll give you a blast on the horn. Or call us on the phone if it's easier. What was that? Thanks, Mules. Right on time after a buffo week at the Kit Kat Club. <laughs> oh, you might wish to use the back stairs. Okay, thank you. Benny? Yep. You got the word out among ventriloquist dummy makers. So far, no one's contacted them, but they'll call. What are you doing with the money? They counted it. How much? 
One million bucks, exactly. Tidy little sum. George, look at this. What? This money's from different cities. So? The Bank of Columbus. Here's a bunch from the Des Moines Trust. The Ann Arbor Savings. Money comes from different banks, Pat. That's not unusual. No, it isn't. But the rest of the money's from Minneapolis and Dayton. Five cities. Yes. The same five cities just visited by our friends Charlie, Edgar, and Lolly. One hundred percent of Square One TV is a production of the Children's Television Workshop.